Jim, we have a question for the late night drive through and this question is from William Hall. I have been watching a lot of Smoky Mountain and USWA, and I've become a big fan of Robert Fuller. I love the stud stable with Jimmy Golden. The angle with the Fantastics has been my favorite so far in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. He made a hammerlock look like a believable finisher. <laughs> my question is, if he had been booked by WCW as a badass instead of Colonel Parker, where do you think his career would have went? Oh, good Lord. Uh, probably not as far as it did, because you got to remember at the time he became Colonel Parker, he'd been in the business for 25 years. Robert, he had to be in his mid forties at that point. And I'm sure he probably would have much rather if he was here and we asked him, he'd say he much rather preferred at that point to get paid to be a manager and talk, which his promos were incredible. Um, I never would have thought I saw Robert Fuller as a baby face in 1972, 73, 74. I would have never thought he'd be one of the best promos in wrestling. Uh, as, cause as a young baby face, he wasn't, but as a middle-aged heel, he was fucking classic. And, you know, Robert and Jimmy were doing a great job for me in Smoky Mountain as a tag team in the ring. But when he went down there just to start at WCW, I'm sure he was not in in the mood to go in as a wrestler in his 40s and and try to uh, start from scratch with a new audience with all those other guys that were there. His 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 promos were a strong point. And I think it probably was best that he'd be a manager then. Now, if, 10 or 15 years before that, that had been a different story, but it wasn't. He showed up in WCW as Colonel Parker shortly after a Bluegrass Brawl 93. Did he give you notice? Were you finishing him and Jimmy up? How did it happen? Yeah, no, he he told me because um, actually they just they had the idea for the for the gimmick and wanted to bring him in. So he had he had told me ahead of time he was going and we were finishing up. They, they still worked through, I believe the end of April because, or at least the middle of April. Cause I think we finished him up actually on the middle of the month's house shows in Knoxville and Johnson city. And when did you first hear that Jimmy Golden was going to be eventually in there as bunkhouse buck? Um, well, it, if it happened close together, probably about the same time, <laughs> or if not, I, I can't remember whether Jimmy hung around, but see here that Jimmy had been a single, before Robert became available. So once I brought Robert in, teamed him up with Jimmy, after Robert left, it's awful hard to be a part of a top tag team and then your partner leaves and you just move into a, a spot. So I, it, Jimmy needed to go away for a while anyway. So I was happy for him. He's making more money than I was paying him. And I didn't have to use him anymore because if I'd have booked him at that point, it would have been just to put him on the card and that would have been taking up somebody else's spot. So once again, when people move around and, and change locations and change promotions, it keeps them fresh. He had been long retired and successful in business. So you weren't going to be able to bring him in probably for any sort of match or anything. But at any point in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, did you ever approach Ron Fuller about making an appearance at a Night of Legends or at any other event? Because he had been not just a promoter, but a major star in that part of the country. Um, well, no, actually, because... He was at the time owned the hockey team, uh, the pro hockey team in Cincinnati and had some other things going on and was living up there. And, and Robert actually was working for him part time while he was wrestling for me. He was working for Ron in the Cincinnati office, uh, the soccer team or the hockey team. Um, he just he didn't really have any interest. As a matter of fact, until he got that bug in what the summer of 2000, he came back and ran some shows outdoors at Chilhowee Park that summer because everything was so hot with the Attitude Era and the Monday Night Wars. Uh, he really didn't have anything to do with wrestling for a long time there in the 90s. And then, of course, I'm standing next to Ron Fuller, his first night in Chilhowee Park with no television whatsoever and just using some people that were over in Knoxville and like the Rock and Roll Express and, and my OVW guys uh, on the undercard and some decent spots. <laughs> but certainly not huge names or a big flying budget. He had probably, I, as I recall, 14, 1500 people in chill Howie park. And he was standing there. Cause remember now this would be the first wrestling show. He'd probably promoted in 15 years. Well, not 15, but at over 10 years. And he was looking with his mouth open and I'm like, Robert, Ron, this is pretty good. He's like, this is horrible. He remembered what crowds used to be like. <laughs> For when, you know, when wrestling actually drew on a regular basis and he couldn't understand why 
that, you know, uh, that he didn't have 3000 people there for that show instead of, you know, 1500. It, it was just, it was, it was such a, a culture shock for him anyway. No, he just, he, he was not doing anything related to wrestling at that point. One last question about the Fullers. And it's one I recently uh, thought of was obviously I've heard you tell the story about Robert Fuller being fired as Booker in 1979 from Memphis and taking his crew and leaving. It is interesting timing wise that that happened right at just about the same time that the split in Knoxville happened, where Bob Roop, who was the booker, quit, and him, Ron Garvin, the great Malenko, Bob Orton Jr., Ron Wright, go and start all-star wrestling and running against Ron Fuller, and he needed a new crew. Yeah. And Robert Fuller and his crew were ready to just jump in there and run with it. Well, and see, that's uh, uh, another part of the story was that they had a big show in Knoxville. I think it was either that April or May, and Harley Race came in to defend the NWA world title. And wouldn't you know who won the pony? This was a story that I kept here, and I think it was Bob Armstrong got the title shot, or maybe he'd gotten the last one, and then one of the – but uh, uh, Garvin, Roop, Orton, that side was mad because it seemed like whenever there was a big show – uh, or whenever there was a, a big tournament or a new vehicles getting bought by the Fuller family or whatever, the, the family and or Bob, because he was in the office and, and booked a lot of it, were getting all the big opportunities and they weren't and their checks were down. And uh, so at the same time as then here comes Robert back with all these guys, that's their handpicked crew. And, and uh, uh, you know, the money was going to be split even more different ways. I'm not surprised that they were probably pissed off about their money when they'd been carrying the territory over there. 